Let's go. Welcome to Citizen. Got a very special guest today, Shane Cashman. How's it going? It's going well. Thanks for having me. Yeah, Cashman, that's an interesting name. Yeah, it's uh, Irish from my dad. My dad's side is yeah. all from uh, County Cork. Do you know what the etymology is? No. W were you guys it, like it tax pretty, collectors or some shit? Yeah, right? You would think so. It was pretty crappy growing up with that name and being so poor. <laughs> you know, like we had, we had no money. We lived on a, I lived on a farm most of my life on a horse farm and uh, yeah, had not a lot of cash. So that was a joke at school. Well, you know, it could be worse, I guess you could still be there. Actually being on a, a horse farm these days might be preferable to being in the city. Oh, totally. I would much rather be on the horse farm. There's lots of property and some good horses. Yeah. So tell me about your, uh, you got a pretty interesting background. I know you, um, you've been on Drink It Bros relatively recently, a couple months ago, I think. Um, but yep. for those that didn't see, um, tell me about your background a little bit. Yeah, that was a fun podcast. That was great. Loved loved doing that show. Mm -hmm. So, I uh, yeah, grew up on a horse farm uh, right outside of the United States Military Academy in New York, where my parents are coaches. And I kind of lived there in the middle of nowhere for the majority of my life till uh, I moved away and. Uh, after after that, I went to college, which is probably one of the only re regrets of my life, is doing that whole situation and then becoming a professor, which is another, I would say, slight slight regret because of how little they paid. Uh, but it was fun teaching. I taught literature and fiction and, and journalism. And it was fun getting this, you know, share ideas and teach kids what objectivity and subjectivity was because they somehow went through high school not learning any of that. And then at the end of my almost 10 years of being a professor, COVID happened. I, there was no way I was going to take a shot to continue working there. And uh, I was already planning on leaving that situation anyway. So I quit. And uh, within like a week or two, I ended up getting the job I have now, which is writing full time for Tim Pool's website, TimCast.com, where I've, been, I've done uh, profiles on people like Kanye, Carrie Lake. Uh, I did this rapper Riff Raff recently, Alex Jones. And, uh, and I do that. And then I also write about true crime and like serial killers and stuff like that. Um, so you said uh, you were teaching, you were a university professor until what, like 2020? Yeah, that uh, I went back for one semester right after the, the riot summer, and then I quit that semester. So yeah, it's probably 2020, yeah. Um, and you, you mentioned um, that the kids that were coming out of, you, I assume you taught some 101 classes, so the kids coming out of high school didn't really understand the difference. They, they don't understand uh, things like rhetoric or objectivity versus subjectivity and shit. Um, but that's, yeah. it isn't like they're, I, I don't want people to get confused and think that high school education is bad. And then you come to university and get it fixed. I mean, usually what happens in my experience is that that ignorance is kind of reinforced or, or maybe the ignorance is codified into iron law, right? That, uh, subjectivity mm -hmm. is, is taken over objectivity at this point. Yeah. I could show them two different articles. One that I knew was objective one that, and the other one was, uh, objective and they couldn't tell the difference we'd have to comb through like what makes something subjective because they're seeing everything as being subjective and and typically you know uh they're all obsessed with politics or at least they think they are so we're kind of breaking down politics for them in ways that they didn't get in high school which is you know it's understandable but i think a lot of public schools are a waste of time uh i mean i think it's worth going uh but i also know some people who dropped out of high school who are doing much better than me sure. uh, but yeah people showed up to class it wasn't just that they would not know basic stuff like uh i would find myself teaching basic science to some of them just in terms of what is below freezing temperature they didn't know that you know they didn't know basic geography so you know it was writing and it was english but it kind of branched out into all these different directions which was fun i love talking about all that stuff but it, it definitely said a lot on what these kids were learning in their various public schools and then also being in college, being able to see what other professors are doing around mm. them, which is kind of the, the caricatures of their teaching about the cultural revolution in the positive light, you know, stuff like that. Well, I mean, look, it's not like 60 million people died or anything. Um, right. <laughs> so who, who cares? No, no um, famine, no yeah. famine, no beheadings. It was totally great. It was yeah. like Woodstock. Um, what do you think? about the um i mean i so so this attack on epistemology is uh 
I think kind of just the natural evolution of cultural Marxism, to be honest. I mean, it, it is what um, was being alluded to in 1984 by Orwell when he said in the end, the party would say two plus two equals five and you'd have to believe because the logic of their position demands it. I mean, that's the, that is the ultimate fruition of, of cultural Marxism. And, and I wonder how anybody can still stomach that knowing that it does attack epistemology. I mean, what, what is exactly you, you've got more experience uh, with this than I do certainly having been at a university teaching, but what is the, what's the steel man? What's the steel man argument of, uh, uh, there should be no objective truth, right? Like, can you steel man that argument? Yeah, for them, uh, they would probably say it's for the for their quote unquote greater good, right? Because mm-hmm. they believe that they've shaped their whole narrative around this false reality that we might agree on as being a false reality. That they uh, they have to do these things from a subjective place because the world around them is so wicked, which we could probably also agree on, but we would disagree on what makes it wicked, right? Um, so I think they also come up through the school system uh, from early on, having believed certain type of things on what it means to be a good person, what certain words mean. You know, they you know they apply words like racism, sexism, misogyny, uh, far right. They have these very like obtuse understandings of those words. So by the time they get to college, it's kind of like they're. Um, in their final training ground before they get into the real world and get to tackle all those monsters that they believe truly exist. Uh, so I, I experienced a lot of that and, uh, I'm not, I'm not saying I was like de-radicalizing, but I was trying to help kids who would see the world a certain way because they might hand in an essay or a story that was clearly written from a place where, uh, they think they're being loving, but it's clearly hateful. Uh, so I'm kind of like delicately walking them through this because, they see the world around them as incredibly dangerous, uh, but they see different monsters than I see, you know? So that was like 10 years of that. And it got worse every semester. Every semester to be a new thing you just, you couldn't say in a classroom. I would say it, but you could get that feeling of like, oh, he just said this, but it was like something, it would turn overnight. Hmm. Uh, every semester, it was crazy. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's not a great idea for the state to be in charge of education. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> definitely. Uh, I, definitely. I, I, that, this is something that I've never understood and how it became so fucking popular, considering how antagonistic towards government um, both parties have been in different time periods. Sometime in the early part of the 20th century, the state kind of took over public education. Uh, and, you know, it was informed primarily by people like Henry Ford or, you mm-hmm. know, uh, some of the other large captains of industry at the time who, who would animate – Things like uh, I we we want we don't want you know critical thinkers we don't want creative thinkers we want people just smart enough to run the machines basically is what they were looking for right um, and yeah. despite those comments being pretty public the the general public still kind of accepted the state's control over education for some reason and I'm not entirely sure how that happened I mean I know a lot of things were going on from World War One to two. Uh, the Great Depression, Spanish flu. There's a lot of turmoil back then. And during times of chaos, people do seem a little more uh, uh, easily duped, you know, by savior, mm-hmm. saviorism from yep. the government. But goddamn, man, I mean, this is ridiculous. Yep. Oh, it's uh, well, that was one of the blessings of COVID was how many people kind of woke up to the idea that uh, the government's trying to replace God and the parent. Mm. And they've been doing that for a minute. Right. But a lot of people are like, whoa, whoa, whoa. The school's doing this, they're doing this, whether it's gender ideology, whether they're talking to kids about race at like a ridiculously young age or at all. Um, and then, you know, everything else, whether it comes back to the objectivity, subjectivity, how they're viewing politics, who they're viewing as extremists, you know, they've kind of been slowly radicalizing children forever. And it's also, and, and it's probably not just one uh, consequence that brought us there, it's everything. Both parents are out of the house now working. They are like really relying on schools. Uh, public schools are free. Uh, but you know, so people can't afford to send their kids to a private school, which may or may not be better. You know, we opted out of public schools for our kids, uh, which I'm grateful for, uh, but you still can't just trust any private school. We, we interviewed mm-hmm. a lot of different places because we want to make sure that they're not going to uphold certain things, you know, cause 
they could slip in ideas with, and they might not even realize it because some of these ideas that are so they're so invasive they they come out in different random ways whether they might show the children something that you don't agree with uh which is, is has happened you know and we live in a community where there's a lot of kids in public school so we can see a lot of these kids coming home with certain ideas that we kind of have to shield from our kids not that we're gonna you know keep them under a rock their whole life but and hopefully instill in them a foundation where they can see these ideas that i think are terrible dangerous ideas and uh understand that that's wrong you know yeah it's a big part of <clears throat> cultural marxism is that it, it, it is it is completely antithetical to the uh to the american experience right because the, one, yep. one, of, one of the key features of cultural marxism is that everything including your children including your own thoughts belong to the state right that um you know your your the capital that you make during your time some portion of that belongs to the state the idea of the government's money like oh the government's spending uh too mm -hmm. much or the government's spending money on stuff like no the government's not spending its money it's spending our money that's right. not how that works it's our money. Um, exactly and this i i think the um you know the most obvious counter to this is uh you know whatever libertarianism is pe people have <laughs> it, it is <laughs> the most fractured of all the uh, uh political ideologies but at its core yeah. it's just that property rights are the most important thing and then you can you know uh discuss what exactly it means for something to be a property right i think the ultimate property right is autonomy over your own life and thoughts and shit like that but um yep yeah it's it's there's certainly we've gotten to this point in Western culture where all the bullshit that we fought against, like uh, aristocracies and mm -hmm. the idea of, I mean, cultural Marxism is basically just another form of feudalism so far as I can tell, right? I mean, you're just, you're, yeah. you're, you're extracting wealth and agency out of the population and giving it to a select few people who get to decide things. And we've, we've literally fought a bunch of wars to stop this shit. And now yep. here it is again. It's like, man. Yeah, what, 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 I, what I exactly wonder, do we have to do to annihilate this fucking shit? Yeah, I, you know my my crazy theory that I think I share with a lot of other people is that you know, a lot of bad people infiltrated our government at the end of World War II because we hired them, mm -hmm. you know, with something like Operation Paperclip. You know, maybe it was a bad idea bringing a lot of Nazis, despite how smart we might have thought they are. But I think these these uh, evil ideas always find their way into a population. It seems like it's almost like a natural you know, weather pattern that is going to pop up after maybe a certain amount of luxury or modernity, these evil ideas kind of sneak back in because everyone's so complacent because modernity is so nice, you know, we're so comfortable. Uh, and then it just finds its way back in like weeds in your garden. Um, and we're there, we're there again. And with cultural Marxism, I, I definitely see it here because the way cultural Marxism seems to, well, it does, it, it destroys the past everything art language the children mm -hmm. so they can remake the future right and then everything we've experienced over the last i mean it's been accelerated in the last few years but it's been going on for decades is that idea of like oh you can't like that artist you can't make that kind of art you can't say this that word doesn't mean that anymore those kids belong to us they can't do this you know and then they tax you into oblivion so you're kind of enslaved to the system mm -hmm. and uh we're like kind of at the peak it feels like we're at the peak of it now because uh, they haven't like revealed themselves as the, the dirty communists that we know they are. But it's like we're there and we're seeing this all happen. It looks a lot like uh, China in many ways. We haven't had the mass famine yet. You know, we haven't been dragging people out and beheading them in the town square yet. But, uh, you know, there's ideas are everywhere because it's like, like the four pest campaign, right? What they were doing to killed a certain uh those four pests that like the swallow which when they killed the swallow the swallows ate the bugs that ate the, that were eating the crops so when the bugs are able to flourish the crops destroyed uh and now you see that happening now with these campaigns to kill mass slaughter animals for climate change you know it's happening in ireland i think they're about to slaughter a few hundred thousand cows because it's going to help for climate change it always works uh, whenever whenever we interfere with nature <laughs> it works every single time so it's a great idea to play god yeah, yeah why not why not so Jesus it's it's Christ. fucking ter it's fucking terrifying and people love these ideas they're like yeah, yeah. do it why not yeah it's not not just it, it's we, we live in the dumbest period in human history i think i really do believe that you know um yeah it's w while we haven't seen mass famine and we haven't seen uh at least in our country and haven't seen public beheadings we have seen hundreds of people 
uh, imprisoned for trespassing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, for for doing yep. for doing what uh, a previous people had encouraged to do, or like I don't know, let's say women's rights group had done just two years prior, for example, right? At the uh, Hart right. Senate, or maybe it was three years at the Hart Senate building. Uh, they tried yep. to go into SCOTUS and, and fuck that place up, but they weren't allowed. So they break break through <laughs> barricades, occupy yep. a place for a while. Not one person gets fucking charged with a crime or imprisoned. And you're seeing people get like 20 year sentences for staying within the stanchions inside of a fucking uh, a, a building that we paid for, by the way. It's a, um, our building. Yeah. 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 It's, our, it's, it's our building. No, so, so it is happening. Crazy. And I think the famine part. Yeah. I think I think we're creating plenty of it. Right. Just not in our own country. Um, yeah. You know, I can't imagine that any of the things we've done in Iraq or Yemen or Syria have been beneficial to that local population. So, you know, we're just outsourcing our famines to brown people at this point. That is true. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you look at all the wars that we like to get into for various reasons. And yeah, we are. It doesn't seem like any of those places are doing any better. And they seem to rejoice when we leave all of a sudden. And especially when we give them all those helicopters. You know, they, they love that stuff. Um, it, it's so bewildering. I, you know, I just see a lot of people now in college, in the college world that I'm still, I don't want to say friends with because I've been kind of excommunicated. They, they refuse to see that as a reality. They still promote this stuff, you know. And when you're talking about people going to jail for this, like, you know, this, I was calling it just tourism for mm -hmm. the Capitol. Uh, we also have a vice president who had people in her campaign uh, donating money to arsonists during the riot summer. And they seem to be fine. You're right. Uh, so I saw a summer of complete absurd violence and fires. Uh, and then it turned around on what they want to use on January 6th against the people, their political enemies. And they go so hard. Look what they're doing to Trump. You know, we're about to maybe see a third arrest. So I guess we are kind of there. It's just we're not defining it as such in terms of like, you know, maybe the famine isn't exactly like what it would be in China. Mm. But we have, like you said, outsourced the famine. And then in my mind, it could just be coincidence. So I'm just going to say this is my theory, but it seems like our infrastructure is collapsing. Mm. You look at, you know, we, we've had mass cow deaths here. Sure. But at what they said, it wasn't because of slaughter. It was, it was something weird happened. The whole place exploded. I don't understand how a cow farm explodes and all those cows die. Or you look at the train derailments, which, again, just could just be a coincidence, could be a symptom of incompetence, which is clearly the case in our government. Uh, but we just keep seeing this uh, continual uh, derailments of, hazardous materials that are destroying these small towns that our federal government can't even take care of. And I still do believe in a very small government as much as I hate it. You know, I think we need some kind of help for these places like East Palestine, like uh, this place in Pennsylvania that just had this other uh, hazardous mm -hmm. dump with this derailment. But our, our government's completely failing those places. Uh, you know, I, my hometown was just flooded, uh, destroyed, like biblically uh, a week or two ago. And it'll be interesting to see how they how they fix that, because it's I'm, I'm hearing from the mayor just earlier today that there's like thirty four million dollars in damage just to the, the town's property. And so this is like the glorified souvenir shop of a town to West Point for the military academy. So it'll be interesting to see how this all plays out. Um, and there's entire bridges that are gone. So it, I, I feel like we're watching our country collapse. If it hasn't fully collapsed already. Um and it, or it just could just it could just be like this coincidence of a pandemic of incompetence. Yeah, but we'll see. Yeah, we will see. I mean, something like sixty to sixty five percent of the bridges in the United States are in some state of disrepair. That seems like uh, not a great yep. thing. It's one thing if it's roads. It's like, oh, there's a bump there. That kind of sucks. Maybe I'm going to have to get For my sure. tires replaced a little earlier than I anticipated. But when bridges collapse, that's not great. Um, Dude, th th there's one bridge that got washed away, which is like there's only three ways to escape this area, mm. which is kind of like why George Washington picked it for West Point mm. or for you know, pre-West Point to yeah. fight the British because they had this great lookout. So there's only three ways to leave. The one bridge is now gone. That bridge, the, the state of New York has been working on for about 10 years because there was another bridge that collapsed out Midwest. They're like, oh, we got to fix all the bridges. So for 10 years, they've been supposedly strengthening this bridge with our money. Just to see it get washed away in a big storm, you know, yeah. like what the fuck? We just spent all this money. You had that bridge closed for forever. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Uh, and there it goes. It's ridiculous, and it's not. By the way, this isn't a, a partisan issue. So, um, right, taxes have real income is is going down rapidly right yep. now, and has been yep. for about thirty years, give or take. Um, and you know, taxes have increased. The government continues to spend money on bullshit that we don't agree with. Uh, regardless of what side of the political aisle you're on, the government is spending money on things that do not affect our country necessarily or uh, or benefit our country, at least. 
and uh, from either side of the aisle, it seems like that would be a pretty good rallying point for people who are, have disparate political beliefs. And then, you know, uh, <clears throat> as far as infrastructure goes, we can't get it right. I mean, there's mm -hmm. most major liberal run cities have issues with infrastructure, uh, but Texas as a whole with the energy grid here, they, there, there have been, uh, there's been about 10 years now since a review was done, found it wanting and gave specific requirements to upgrade the energy grid here and not one goddamn thing has been done. Now this is a That's Republican insane. governor in both houses of the legislature yep. here. So you can't yep. blame that one on the fucking libs. Um, right. And you don't win any points, by the way, by pointing to the fire and, and saying, oh, fucking Democrats started that fire. You don't win by that. You win by putting out the goddamn right. fire. You know what I mean? So yep. um, and then, you know, as far as famine goes, even domestically, about 20 million people in the United States are on a day to day basis affected by what we call food deserts. Right. Which means they don't have mm -hmm. access to affordable fresh food, which means they're eating mm -hmm. bullshit food from the uh, the center aisles of cheap grocery stores that are already kind of fucked up. And, uh, you know, that's why 40 percent of the people in America right now are either in pre diabetes or have full blown fucking diabetes. Forty percent, like 38 percent. But I mean, Jesus Christ, crazy that, that that's, that's as close to a famine as I think you can get in the modern West, because yep. these people are malnourished and obese at the same time. Yeah, that's so true. And they've also priced, they're pricing people out of the grocery store. Mm. I mean, the last few years, the, the groceries have gone up so crazy. Uh, I mean, we were in New York, like in a, in the Hudson Valley, about an hour north of New York City, and it was just unlivable. And thank, you know, thank God we, we were able to leave and we're in West Virginia now, where price of living's cheaper and there's a little more freedom. But uh, still, the, the gas prices, the, the grocery store, it's it's unbelievable. The, the tax prices up in New York, I mean, I don't know where that money was going. It, well, they were telling us it was going to that bridge that got washed away the other day. Uh, and the roads there are terrible, too. But, yeah, no, I think it's, you know, it's it's not the famine. It's almost like how war changes. You know, every, every kind of war throughout the ages is a different type of war. Mm. And it's like people now, you know, when they say a civil war, they say famine. We probably, or at least I am, we're thinking of what it used to look like. It is different now. So I think you just painted a pretty ugly and true picture of this weird famine we're in now where it's they're eating what I think is poison mm. out of those aisles in the grocery store. The water is certainly poison. I mean, the city water is, I think. Um, and those those the foods in the grocery stores are gross. And now we have people. I think it's Bill Gates who has the appeal. You know about appeal? Oh, yeah. It's like a new. Yeah. Like this is insane. <laughs> and like, why are we letting this guy do anything? I have no uh, idea. And then, and then but, those shots. <laughs> yeah. I, I base most of my political opinions on how South Park uh, talks shit about whatever's going on because <laughs> they did an ep they did an episode about uh, uh, Beyond Meat, right? And and Cartman yep. is like raising hell because they're putting Beyond Meat in in there. And then he fucking looks at the ingredient list. He goes, "Oh, this is terrible for you. I love this stuff." Um, uh, it's so American. They're, yeah, they're the best. But it's like uh, you know, it started what in the fifties, I guess, with corn syrup. We we and you can mm -hmm. you can see some of the goddamn. Uh, it, it's almost like, I don't know what, th th this is again, I know that people are, I guess, more informed about basic medical shit today than they were in the 1950s. But mm -hmm. how did, how like, <laughs> I don't understand how people just accepted uh, high fructose corn syrup. You know what I mean? Because before yeah. it, it was used to fatten pigs for slaughter. And then they're like, hey, right. this is sweeter than sugar and at half the price. Here you go. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. what the Load fuck? Up. What the fuck? Yeah. How did that? I don't understand I, how the general population didn't look at that and be like, nah, I'm not doing that. That's stupid. I think that I know the general population, I, I think, is there's a lot of reasons. I think they're really busy with the jobs that they're working. And we're not like people aren't looking at the news or looking at the stats or looking into things at all. And they also a lot of people still believe in the authorities of the corporate media that is telling them, you know, I remember growing up like realizing how stupid the media was because it'd be like one week the milk is bad for you and a month later that same milk is now good for you and it's bad and good it's bad and good everything back and forth I'm like you can't listen to these people and everything they say they contradict themselves every time they come on the air but a lot of people don't have time you know and uh they'll they'll just buy into it my parents are like that you know my grandparents are like that they believed in what the media told them the five news channels that mm -hmm. they have uh and that was that and then when i come in and tell them something that's a little like alternative to that they'd be like well that sounds fucking nuts why would mm. you say that you're crazy 
I'm like, okay, um, I'm telling you. But they, they, that's how they are. That's how a lot of people are. Uh, but again, COVID kind of changed that for a lot of people. Obviously not everybody because we saw a lot of these people in this country go fucking bananas mm. for everything the government told them. And I saw some of my most punk rock friends from growing up in the, I was in like the hardcore metal scene playing shows. Those, we were all like, oh, fuck the government. They came around and they were just taking everything the government told them to do. You know, they were happy to because they believed that now the, they were tricked into believing that the people like their old friends like me were now the authority that they had to rage against. But it was, you know, basically not basically it was definitely the government who was saying oh you can't you can't go to this grocery store anymore because you don't have the papers you don't have the shot you can't work that job anymore you're kicked out of the military you're kicked out of this and that and i was like you don't see the problem with this and like no it's for the greater good i'm like what the fuck does that even mean yeah and then they say other shit like you know, the right side of history which is also dumb as fuck Doesn't or mean anything or our democracy Oh, yeah. Our democracy. That's, that's one that of my one. favorites. Yeah. Uh, this is a fight for democracy. I'm like, well, I'm not really interested in democracy, to be honest, because I, right. I, really, I don't understand the obsession with, uh, I mean, I guess it was better than uh, being under dictatorial rule, right? Uh, that's right. certainly true, I guess. Mm -hmm. But right. if you live in a town of, uh, like, Austin has a million people in it, right? Um, yeah. So for de democracy gives me one one millionth agency over my life. That's that's right. that doesn't it's it's better than zero, I guess, but it's not as good right. as fuck you mind your goddamn but, business, which is the way this country was designed in the first place, which is, you know, to limit the scope and size of government. That's the whole kind of point here, you know, exactly. And, and this is another symptom of how public schools kind of fucked up the kids because they come out of school believing what democracy is or that this is even a democracy. And like it's like they learned everything so upside down. So they come out, they hear certain candidates who are clearly uh, like communists or they're coming from a communist point of view. Uh, but they're saying they're for democracy. Uh, so it's like they're, they're able to pull the strings and all the things they've un mis mislearned uh, in, in school. Uh, and yeah, it, it's happening right now at almost every college. <laughs> and uh, I'm so glad I'm not in that world anymore. I felt like I feel kind of bad that I've, I'm not there because I was offering at least a percentage of like an al an alternative view on how they're being taught. But uh, they ended up pushing everybody out if you weren't going to get the uh, vaccine. Yeah. So how do you, uh, you know, sit, from your perspective, having been an educator like that, um, I think and most of the people I know who currently are or were educators, people like uh, Peter Boghossian, um, for example, who's, you know, since left. But, uh, you know, he, he's doing a lot of work now trying to repair our epistemology. But. From your perspective, what do you think are like how how are we how are we going to get back to that? Is it is there a roadmap to repair? Like, is there a roadmap where boomers, X millennial, zennials all kind of agree on the same fact base again, or is that done? And and if so, then you know what what are we going to do about that? I think it's done. I keep saying that we live in an alternate dimension. Like you've been talk you talk to these other people. They they see we could look at the same thing. You know, I was I was realizing this during the Rittenhouse thing or the George Floyd uh, situation where I'm like, it's not what you're saying it is. But we're watching the same video and you're walking away with a completely different interpretation. And then, I mean, it was kind of Trump, too, because you could watch Trump and they would see a monster. And I'm like, I, I don't see that. You know, I don't know where you're getting that information from. But they're, they're watching very small clips that their media authorities are telling them to watch. Uh, so I think you can slowly repair it. I like to think we could all come back to some type of objective truth. It's going to have to start at home, though. You know, like parents are going to have to really be engaged in their kids' lives uh, because it's going to be hard to kind of start this uh, system of schools that will counter the public schools. Uh, so it's going to have to be like parents really got to work hard at home on their kids, mm -hmm. pay attention to what's going on because I see so many people just gave up or they trusted the authorities around them to parent their own kids. And then when they come home, you know, I don't really, I, I, I see it with a lot of people my age. I'm, I'm 38 now. I see a lot of people who kind of just, they still believe in that structure of like, oh, they got to go to school. They got to learn obedience. They got to learn this and that. They got to learn in a textbook. They're going to learn about some of the most important events in history through a few paragraphs or like a little chapter. And uh, we have to find a way to counter that. But it's going to have to start like at the smallest part, which is the most important part, which is at home. Sure. Uh, but but they but they've also been promoting not having kids. So it might just this this terrible idea could just self you know correct itself by people not having kids.
which a lot of people who are, are left leaning seem to not have kids. Yeah, it's interesting, right? I, I actually had the same conversation with someone last night um, <clears throat> about, you know, how kind of fucked everything is right now. And they're worried about the future and how are we ever going to like these these people are out there doing all this crazy stuff. How are we going to fight back against that? It's like I I there is some hope, certainly. I mean, I there oh, yeah. there is a like they, they will. <laughs> You know, they, they're not, you're, you're right. They're not breeding. Um, I mean, look, when I was in Austin, uh, the last time my wife and I walked around for a while and it was just, we didn't see a lot of children. mm. I mean, we were just in the city's part, but you know, even in Manhattan, you walk around and see like strollers. Uh, it was just weird to me. I mean, it was just one day, so it's not like a great example, but it was odd to me to see like almost no parents. Maybe they, everyone had babysitters. It's kind of hard for us to get a babysitter, but I was like, man, this is a city with not a lot of kids. Uh, but I also think Austin's got a pretty high percentage of like gender uh, surgeries going on for younger kids. I believe mm-hmm. that they were saying that at one point. So, you know, I wouldn't want kids there anyway. Yeah, no but, yeah, I mean, it was it was bizarre. But I think there's a lot of people who just think, oh, the world is too bad. It, we can't bring kids into it. I'm like the only way to get this world better is to bring kids into it. Yeah, 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 I, yeah. I'm like that's how that's how you do it. That's you well, I mean that fix anything. The, the person I was talking to was said some of the effect of, um, yeah, I'm worried that the future is just going to be a bunch of fucking genderless weirdos running around. I'm like, well, it doesn't really work <laughs> that way because the, these people are like they're sterilizing their children. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or it, right. at, at worst, they're they're socially sterilizing them on both sides. Um, I know, you know, uh, so I guess the solution to that is just, uh, and this is a multi pronged situation. So there's not one, one solution, but one solution is, um, or one part of the solution rather is to outbreed the commies. Right. I think that's probably a good idea. Like you should have as many children as you can afford to, frankly, if you right. care about the future of this country. Totally agree. I totally agree. It's weird though. Like, you know, they, they want more workers for the communists. But their ideology, the modern ideology, is making it so they're not going to have any workers. Um, yeah, I, I, so like we, we, there's a lot of kids in our community, uh, you know, who are our oldest. Our son is you know, interacting with, and they go to public schools and they come home. And they, these are young kids. My son's seven. And these kids are between seven and ten, and I can hear them outside talking about gender and race already. I'm like, what the fuck? I, it's insane to me. Um, so I, I, what's going to happen? Is either they're going to grow up to be like their uh, the the way their parents want them to be, which is this like leftist, cultist, genderless blob, or they're going to revolt against that mm. and be like pretty hard against it, which is interesting. Which is also I think very possible. Yeah, we yeah. might get we might actually see that future where there's like the these kids turning against their insane parents, like wow, mom and dad are insane. Why do they do that to us? Um, so that'd be interesting to see, actually. Yeah, I can't wait for the 2040 uh, version of Rage, <laughs> Rage Against the Machine, where it's and, and it's it's all they're doing is saying stuff like uh, women have uteruses. You, know, you oh got to write a God. song around yeah. that, and you know, people are like, "Whoa, man, these guys are out there." Um, super punk rock. Yeah, but it's you know, it, it's easy to be fucking uh, irritated and even glib about this stuff. It's easy to be. Uh, it's easy to become cynical about it as well, but yep. you know, th- again, one one of the approaches I think certainly is to have kids to outbreed these commie idiots. But um, <clears throat> we also have to repair our uh, institutions. You know, we have to repair first and foremost. Um, we have to repair our fact base. You know what I mean? Like that's got mm-hmm. to matter. It's got. There have to be some. There has to be some objective reality that the vast majority, and I think there is, by the way. So I think mm-hmm. it, this is more of a perception change, and maybe yeah. a, a reorganizing of the way people, you know, just the Socratic method being reintroduced back into pretty much yep. every facet of life. But yep. I'll tell you what's not going to work. You're not going to win any of these people back, and you're not going to repair any of these institutions mm-hmm. or our epistemology by making them feel stupid for what they used to or currently believe that doesn't work. Yep. Like you can't shame totally. somebody. You can, I mean, that's not true. You can shame somebody into leaving a belief, but once they start that process, if the shame continues then they will recoil, you know what I mean? And mm-hmm. it's like, oh, yeah. I, if, if it, if for you, if it's just about winning the argument, if it's just about 
uh, spiking the football and declaring victory, then you're kind of a cunt, to be honest. I mean, that's not right. really yep. that you don't give a fuck about your country. You just care about winning at that point. Oh yeah, I totally agree. I you know I, I'm like a masochist with my friends were who are trying to disown me for saying certain certain things about either in support of Trump or against the riots. Uh, and I would I would spend days talking to them. And I of course it would feel good to spike that ball and be like I fucking won this shit. But I'm being like, look. You got to change the way you see the world because I think you're seeing it really wrong. And you're also your your best arguments on your side for at least for this group of friends I'm thinking about was to just insult me, just to use bad words. I'm like, you're not getting anywhere. So I'm like, I'm I'm trying to be patient, you know. But we have to bring people over, and that's something I see on on the right. Whereas like, I'll see people on the left openly say we were wrong about this. Now, look, I'm not so much for the whole amnesty for certain people with the COVID stuff, mm. especially like Fauci, like. That's that's insane. That's a criminal. But um, for certain people who just kind of bought into that narrative and as bad as they might have been, I'm willing to like be like, I don't even need them to apologize. But them saying we were wrong is enough to be like, all right, just let them go. Let them keep learning. Like, that's great, because if they if we can keep winning those type of people over, that is a way forward into a better future, you know, mm-hmm. outside of having kids. But the thing, you know, I was saying about living in an alternate dimension, you know, what I really mean is like. And what's going to be hard about making that better future is that they killed language, right? And that's what I saw that in the colleges, and we see that in the media. We see that with our our groups of friends, whatever, who who we might disagree with. We'll use words that don't even mean the same thing that they used to with those groups of people. Um, I don't know how you reclaim those words anymore, but you know, it's like you're you're watching them effectively destroy language, so then they can rewrite their monsters they're good guys yeah. in a in a certain way so that's the thing to me is like i don't know how we get there yet you know i just don't for me i just don't stop using those words i mm-hmm. use them even more and i use them in the way that i think is the appropriate the real way rooted in, in truth but uh yeah the death of language is the most one of the most concerning things that i saw definitely happening in the colleges and you, but you can see it now in in newspapers and, and media online on twitter you know in conversation where like all right we're not operating from the same reality yeah, change, whenever any anyone, no matter who it is or what side they're on or if it's an institution or an individual, starts fucking around with language, that's a problem. I mean, it always is. I, oh, yeah. I remember in the, in the early 2010s is when I kind of started to notice it um, amongst people that I thought were smart at the time. Mm-hmm. And I, I, mm-hmm. I, guess, I guess they were intelligent. They just fucking weren't, you know. Um, <laughs> like uh, right. I, I remember some kid – some black kid I knew that I actually worked with, he was a, a coworker of mine, said something fucked right. up. I'm like, that's kind of racist. I mean, it's funny what you said is funny about white people. I agree, right. but it is a little right. racist. You know that, right? And he's like, right. no, you, black people can't be racist. I'm like, oh, sweet, really? Okay, <laughs> cool. Uh, and it's like, what do you mean by that? He goes, well, racism is a confluence of, of um, institutional power and racial prejudice. I'm like, no, that's what racial prejudice, uh, institutional <laughs> racial prejudice is. There's already right. a phrase for that institutional right. racial prejudice already exists. And now you're just trying to take mm-hmm. that subset of racism and make it all of racism because that's the one that you can't be guilty of. You understand? You, I, I, I had this conversation with him, like, you see what you did there, right? You took right. the entirety of a very nefarious idea and you whittled it down to one that doesn't apply to you. And now that's all of it. And then you can, yeah. you're free to do whatever you want. Not only are you free to do whatever you want, but you're also perpetually the victim of it, right? And he's like, no, yes. that's not right. Oh, that's, good. that's not right. I'm like, yeah, it is right, actually. And that's why you're angry right now. Right. You know what? That's actually another thing people could work towards uh, if you want to make society better is stop rewarding victimhood. Because mm. the victimhood currency is, I think, a lot of the problems we have right now, especially when you look at like the George Floyd world or really any world right now in the sociopolitical space where they're like, we are the victims. You need to help us. It's like we, we got to stop saying, you know, you're a victim or at least saying that being a victim is is kind of like a currency. We got to, you know, make people want to succeed, compete, you know, that all those things are really important. And they've kind of been robbed from our society. Yeah, cer- certainly. We, we've we kind of, um, <clears throat> whether on purpose or not, I mean, I, I understand. So I d- just operate from the premise that the road to hell is paved with, you know, good intentions. And uh, uh, so it doesn't necessarily matter to me if it was intentional or not. I do think there is some from the the cultural Marxism perspective that is intentional, but I think a lot of the people that got captured by this ideology were just like, it's hard to watch people suffer 
right? Whether their mm-hmm. suffering is real or not, you can't always tell. And you see somebody who looks like they're suffering, that's rough for you to, to look at. And you, you feel compelled to do something about it. That's a good instinct. But we replaced, yep. we replaced serotonin and effort with dopamine and expectation. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. We, we did mm-hmm. away with uh, uh, any kind of ability to, I guess, prolong or not prolong, but uh, 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 um, delay gratification. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? And then yep. uh, uh, we stopped associating effort with outcome. So now we have an association mm-hmm. of expectation on its own, expectation yep. and outcome instead of effort yep. and outcome. And that is fucking dumb, dude. I mean, I, <laughs> like I, I just want to, there's so many different ways that you could set up tests for this. Um, Take two people who are like, take two twins, for example, have one of them train every day for a race and have one of them drink beer and sit on the couch every day and then have them do the race and be like, this is how this works. This is fucking how life works. You know what I mean? One person is clearly going to win that race. Yep. Yep. Yeah. But now we're rewarding people for doing nothing. You know, that's like, it's almost like this widespread, like meaninglessness where people have, because they're in the, the real world has like even less meaning now to a lot of people because they're getting most of that gratification from the internet and i i love the internet i mean it's great we can do things like this and i can learn things all this stuff almost like time travel through the internet but um it's become the new real world for a lot of people which is why things like the metaverse are so exciting for certain types of people because they'll be able to excel in that world that fake world uh which is terrifying you know so we're like that's another thing at home that we're doing is um i'm not anti-tv I just don't want one in my house. Mm. You know, we don't have a TV. Like, I, I'll get distracted. I know how I am. And I know how my, my kids are. I'm like, the, we want the centerpiece of our house to be like the family and talking. Well, you know, the kids will do art and like they're doing sports, playing piano, uh, because the TV is just like a portal to a lot of things that are distractions. And, you know, I love TV shows, I love movies. Mm. And our kids get to see those two certain things. But I walk into other people's houses and it's like the TV's on. And then it's all of a sudden we get sucked into the TV. And I'm like, all right we got to, you know, figure out how to enjoy ourselves either by talking or doing something or going outside, God forbid, mm. you know. It is scary out there. Um, it is. <laughs> and, yeah, to your point about um, you you said um, meaninglessness, I would say nihilism, right? I mean, yeah, that, yeah. so the most powerful tool that any enemy can have over you is if you don't believe in your cause or your country. That's the most powerful yep. tool because uh, I can tell you I've seen belief from people. You know what I mean? I fought people in war that believed yep. in their cause and without any question. And it's a difficult enemy to win against. Uh, it, right. And I've seen people who were like in Iraq, uh, primarily there's two groups of people you fight. One is just like criminal shit bags who are fucking in a, you know, to, to their in their in their defense, I guess to some degree they're in a shitty situation anyways and don't have right. There, there's nothing right. There's no fucking right. uh, uh, there's no cultural or country pride. There's none of that shit, and and they're in right. abject poverty. So you know, every now and again we would jack some dude up because he was just robbing somebody else. Like, all right, cool. I mean, we're not police right. here, but um, then you fight. Huh. You know, jihadis. It's a totally different situation. They don't give up. They they fucking fight yeah. to the bitter end. Yeah. Um, and I look at America now, and in the military, we call this battlefield preparation, right? So before, mm-hmm. during the Cold War, for example, we used to drop, um, <laughs> we used to drop uh, extra large condoms that were marked medium, um, taped to flyers over, uh, over uh, Balt- or not Baltic, but over, uh, you know, um, Eastern Bloc states. And in, inside of Russia as well, in the hinterland, to make them think that American dudes had big dicks. Like that's not that's Holy a that's shit. a that's a real thing that the American <laughs> that, actually the Air Force Intelligence did that. Um, wow, uh, I never really, knew that. Yeah, it's so stupid. Um, I, maybe <laughs> maybe it were. I don't think it had any effect on it, but um, it, it's it's kind of funny. But yeah, it's like wow. um, that is. That is one example of battlefield preparation. I mean, the most common example is setting up supply lines or, uh, you know, firing artillery to soften up a target. But if you're thinking about a cultural war, the artillery is uh, uh, shots across the bow of, you know, your epistemology and your cultural 
uh, uh, I guess, pride, if you want to call it that, right? Like it, yep. but we, instead of talking about how a bunch of dudes in the 18th century, a bunch of white dudes in the 18th century were like, Hey, life is not fair. Let's try to find the, the a way that, it, that our country can grow into the fairest version of a government, right? right. Uh, it's not going to be immediate. I think everybody amongst the founding fathers kind of agreed on that. I mean, even Ben Franklin, uh, who was the most hopeful of all, uh, said things like, um, he said things like, uh, uh, a republic, if you can keep it right. Like it's, it's right. just, it's difficult. This is going to be hard. Right. But yep. I think yep. if you follow these, this set of rules, the constitution and such that over time, we'll get to a place where things are mostly fair. Instead of teaching that we taught, ah, oh, it's just a bunch of land owning white slave owners built mm -hmm. the country on the backs of slavery. And like, all right, cool, man. Cause we're the, uh, the uh, slavery began in in america and it, and it disappeared uh <laughs> after america stopped right that that's just that's how right. it is that's it. uh Very you know and, but that if you're if you're a foreign adversary trying mm -hmm. to to you know take over america or try to weaken america that's a pretty good fucking way to do it mm -hmm. uh, look at like what yuri bezmanov said mm. you've seen those uh oh yeah you know that yeah so like and those are chilling videos where he walks through the steps of dismantling a country. You're like, oh yeah, we're like that right that that part. <laughs> you know, I've, we've experienced all of those things. They've captured every institution. Uh, now it's now it's in the people. And yeah, it's like the the weapons now are just we've uh, like kidnapped people's brains, and now they walk around like these brain dead soldiers uh, who do nothing. I mean, uh, clearly there's some out there who will get violent for the cause because they think they have to, because they're kind of like the jihadists mm. for, you know, the, the left leaning psychopaths. But, uh, most people are just at home with nothing. They, they have no care for anything other than the little curated life that they're creating on the internet. Yeah. It's weird, man. I think of extremists. I don't, I don't think extremism is good in any form, but I, there, yeah. there, there definitely are, there, there are extremists who are worse than others. Right. So like in For religion, sure. uh, an extremist Christian might blow up a fucking abortion clinic or an extremist Muslim might blow up anything that's around them, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, right. Uh, uh, but a, an extremist Jane would mm -hmm. wear cheesecloth over their mouth so they don't accidentally swallow a bug and kill it, right? Because they're so anti-killing right. something. <laughs> and, yep. you know, an extremist Republican would probably fall into the the – the abortion clinic bombing thing and extremist liberals, obviously Antifa, but an extremist, right. I don't know, libertarian is an anarcho capitalist, right? Who's just like, I don't want the government involved in my fucking life. I just want pe yep. I want, I want there to be free trade between individuals. It's like, all right, all right. the, one of these things is clearly not like the others. You know what I mean? Yep. And, yep. uh, I, in, in the sports world, we talk about, uh, high and low ceiling, right? Like this, this player has mm -hmm. got a super high ceiling, but uh, which means they have potential to be great. Um, probably sure. greater than this other person, but this other person is already pretty good. So maybe blah, yeah. blah, blah. And I think that's the debate we're in right now as a culture. People see alternatives to the the duopoly in America as a pipe dream or whatever else. Like, hey, yeah, that mm -hmm. would be good in, in certain situations, but how are we ever going to get there? Nobody takes this stuff seriously. Um, so I get it. I mean, I understand the reticence to some degree because the implementation on yeah. a broad scale is not – our broad scope rather is not easy in any situation. But I also think, and I want to hear your opinion on this, that the greater libertarian population in the West has completely fucked this message up, right? I mean, it's <laughs> al almost all of the attention is at the national level when, when it, if, I mean, a, a real libertarianism doesn't seem like it would, it, it would mostly, the only reason you would go to the federal level to serve is to limit or reduce the size of the government, right? Not to right. implement libertarian policies or whatever the fuck. Right. Yeah. I think uh, that's kind of like what I was saying about the parents needing to take control of the home again to make a better future for the kids. People also need to start looking at how locally, politically, they can get uh, involved. Because the libertarians, you know, people who are anti this big government stepping into your property, uh, we also learned a lot of people, well, a lot of people learned during COVID, like, wow, they have so much power over us. They have power over our schools. They have power over the grocery stores. They have power over the roads. It's insane. And we need to put up a wall between us and those terrible policies that were authoritarian. So, yeah, people need to get in the school boards. People need to get involved locally because, you know, ideally, those are the people who will 
build that, be that shield between you and that federal government that will clamp down on you when they say there's a crisis and you might disagree on what that crisis is. I mean, a lot of us knew fairly early in the COVID, okay, you got to not step on our toes here. Like we're trying to live our life. I'm trying to send my kids to school. You know, people are trying to go to church and now you're going to lock all that down. Uh, you're insane. Um, so that's, that's something people got to focus on is you got to fix what's around. It's kind of like what Peter Jordan Peterson was saying about making your bed. Mm. It's like, you got to fix your community. You got to fix what's around you first, but you're not going to fix anything else before that's under control. Um, cause it's, it could be in a state of disarray. Um, so you got people got to pay attention to those things, but people be like, well, it's too busy. I'm working. I'm like, do you care about a future at all? Do you care about your kids? Do you care about your community? You know, do you, did you like the, the, the government stepping in and telling you to do this or that? I mean, it's ridiculous. So yeah, people have to pay attention, I think locally and then go from there. Uh, and then the other thing is run, libertarians running federally. I, you know, from what I'm, I've been hearing from people in that group is, you know, it's kind of just to spread that message, which could be good, you know, be like, oh, okay, we have a, a platform to spread this message, but they kind of get uh, ignored by the corporate media. And, uh, and then the other thing is people need to stop believing that any president's going to fix their problems, who, no matter who it is. You know, Trump, Biden's definitely not going to do anything. But it's, you can't look at these people as like a savior. It's, it's you and your community that's going to make any saving. Um, and it's going to happen, you know, around you first and then spread outward. Sure, yeah. I, I, I don't understand the hero worship that goes on. Oh, it's very bizarre stupid. to me from either yeah. side of the aisle. I just don't get it. I mean, you know, um, there there aren't a whole lot of candidates at the federal level that I've personally seen that I would vote for over Trump, frankly. Oh, no, um, no. But, you know, I don't understand the worship. It's like if if you if you can say at the same time that you support most of the shit he's doing, but then hold individual parts accountable, then you can limit the scope of those stupid things. You know what I mean? That's mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. I, I, you can't, you don't have to do one or the other. I, I don't understand why people think that if you say, well, Trump uh, did a lot, a lot of the stuff economically and foreign policy wise he did made a lot of sense to me, but uh, banning bump stocks and, spending right. billions of dollars on a vaccine that doesn't fucking do what it says. Right. You know what I mean? Right. And then letting yep. Fauci stay in power. And by the way, I didn't know this until yesterday, but apparently we were still funding the goddamn Wuhan Institute of Virology until yesterday. No. Are you fucking oh, kidding boy. me? It's like, oh, you God. can like, <laughs> yeah. I know that fucking nuts. perfect is the enemy of good. Like we're never going to have a perfect uh, president. Mm -hmm. We're never going to have a perfect administration or, or Congress or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But that shouldn't stop you from saying when something's wrong. Like if you're so captured right. by the right versus left fight that you can't admit when somebody on the right is wrong, that's a big fucking problem. Right. I, I, I also believe Trump so far is the only person worth voting for, but I have so many issues with him. And some of the issues I have with him are some of the biggest things he fucked up, like what you were saying, like with COVID, like with Fauci. I didn't think his pardons were that great. I think they were terrible, actually. As much as I like Lil Wayne, he could have gotten Assange out, right? Mm -hmm. Um but he did, you know, a lot of really good stuff. Uh, and then there's RFK Jr. I'm like, okay, I understand why people really like him. You know, I agree with a lot of stuff he says about about COVID and, and vaccines. But I don't care because he's still a liberal, mm. you know. And we we see where liberalism leads. We're right back to this spot, you know. And uh, so I, I appreciate him. And the other thing that bothers me about RFK Jr. is all the shit he went through with his family. He knows better than anybody how horrible things like the CIA are and the news, right? But he still buys into what those institutions say about Trump. So I'm like, OK, no matter what you were up against with you and your family and everything you guys experienced, he's still believing everything that th they say Trump supposedly is, which is bothersome. Yeah. You know? yeah. So but it sucks. It's like, like there's like 90 percent of stuff he says. I'm like, that's amazing. That's cool. That you're saying that. Totally agree. But uh, yeah, you know, Vivek is, is great. I think he's interesting. He's saying a lot of cool stuff. I don't see him getting to the, that level where he's gonna become president at least this time around. Obviously, DeSantis is a great governor, not a great president, that's a terrible campaign he's running. Uh, and then it's like laughable that Chris Christie's even in this race and, and Pence is a joke. Um, so yeah, for me, it's just like, it's Trump despite all the flaws and uh, you know they're going after him so hard, it's gonna be, it's kind of like if he gets in, it's like putting an atom bomb in the office. Yeah. I, I, at least that's what I feel like, which is exciting. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I don't, the Chris Christie thing I do not get. I don't know what he's up to. Is he writing a book or is he just like throwing fundraisers yes. so he can have the $25,000 plate, you know, dinners and I stuff like that. It. 
Um, I think that's it. Because he's, I mean, certainly politicians are pretty, they're all megalomaniacs and they're certainly uh, delusional to some degree or another, but that's some next level delusion, I think. I mean, th- he just, he doesn't even, crazy. he doesn't even have a point. Like uh, Ramaswamy at least is um, he's got a message that's different than most people's message. And he wants to be an aggressive conservative, yeah. which, which we haven't seen. Let's see. When's the last time there was an aggressive conservative in office? Never. Right. I, I can't honestly can't think of one. Yeah. Somebody that recently, somebody like when's the last president that reduced the size of government? Right. Yeah. I we're still, we're in more debt because of Trump. So yeah. another another one of those things that I disagree with him on on a lot. But yeah, the, the conservatives don't even to me it's like there's no difference between a lot of those people who are supposedly conservatives and and people on the on the left. Like McConnell and Pelosi are the the same thing mm. to me, right? Yeah. And a lot of those people who claim to be conservative, they're they're not because they become like Lindsey Graham. Mm. We're so pro war all of a sudden about you know ukraine i'm like the fuck is wrong with these people why so, even yeah, even I mean, even reagan right so in 81 we passed this tax cut bill that he takes credit the reaganomics that he takes credit for and then over the next eight years they raise taxes back to the previous level right and in the meantime yep. triples the national debt uh fighting micro wars against russia all over the fucking place um yep. and a bunch of illegal shit which is you know whatever governments do illegal shit all the time but um yeah like i don't i can't i think eisenhower was probably the last conservative president which is, uh, you know, 70 years yeah. ago. Well, that's a long time. Yeah. And, and man, people should watch. I think it was it was Ike, right? Who did the On his way uh, out, yeah. That that speech is, people need to watch that. It's such a great speech. And then that, you'll watch that speech. And then, you know, that's about the military industrial complex. Then uh, two years later, JFK gave a, gave a great speech because this is right, right, you know, Ike gave that speech right before JFK was inaugurated. Then JFK gives a great, uh, well, it's not a speech, it's an interview about the media. And in my mind, I'm just like, man, the corporate media is is has been absorbed by the military industrial complex. They're they're the same thing. They're indistinguishable. But uh, yeah, Eisenhower did, did do some great stuff for sure. Uh, but it's funny to think that Trump, who's basically like a New York liberal, mm. old school classical liberal, is now the champion of conservatives. Uh, but uh, he's still not a conservative. Yeah, we might want one. You know, so we'll yeah. see what happens if he gets a second term. I don't know. It'd be great if he uh, becomes even better. Yeah, I think he might go full ham just out of spite to be honest because he is a spite he's a spiteful man which is you know uh if 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 someone's uh megalomania and spite intersects with my principles i don't really give a shit what motivates you frankly yeah um yeah so uh yeah no shit before we get out of here uh tell tell me about some of the stuff you've written uh your book so people can go check out your books and stuff like that and then tell me uh where people tell people where they can find you and see some of your other material yeah. So for, for Tim, for Tim Poole at TimCast, I've got two books we put out in the past two years. And the first one's kind of relevant again, because it's my big investigation into the Long Island serial killer who they supposedly just arrested, mm. which is insane to me. Uh, you know, that's, that's a 13 year cold case that I spent an ungodly amount of time on talking to victims, families, investigating myself with amateur detectives and also talking to the police. Um, and that's a, a really fucked up case. Mm-hmm. So that, that book is at invertedworldbook.com. And you can see that, that giant investigation that I did. I'm probably going to be dipping back into now that they got this guy. And then the more recent book is, so, uh, the second, second in the series for the inverted world is, uh, my investigation into the Confederate gold that went missing down in Georgia after the mm. Civil War, when uh, the Confederacy was dissolved by Jefferson Davis, after they burnt down Richmond, the gold and the cabinet of the Confederacy went south. Most of them wound up in the town of Washington, Georgia. And uh, so I went down to Washington, Georgia and just kind of you know, looked for this gold with people who were also looking for the gold, but then uncovered all this other weird bullshit about witches running a hotel, people who were possessed by ghosts, fucking UFOs. Like it just turned into this like really weird book. I went down to write. I went down to write an article, and it turned into 400 pages of me having uh, these insane discussions, or or God, the death threats I would get for either looking for the gold or trying to ask this ridiculous witch a question. I, and if you listen to, um, so we narrated it and we illustrated this book mm. before we publish it, and uh, that's at timcast.com for members and uh, for people who did sign up and listen to that, which is still available. You can hear the death threat. The one I got, this guy, this fucking idiot sent me the a, a message on the phone with his voice. And I used it. And I'm like, hey, you gave it to me. And he's got this wonderful Bayou accent where he's going to skin me like a dog. All this great shit. Uh, so that's there. That's And that book is at ghostofthecivilwar.com. And then 
all the profiles I've been writing for Tim at the website are at shanecashman.com. And those are all just all the stories that are at timcast.com as well. Like the, I was with Carrie Lake mm. during her election trial. I was with Kanye after uh, the whole Infowars debacle went down. And uh, yeah, most recently I was with Alex Jones in Austin for a few days. So, and, and yeah, you can find me at Shane Cashman at all the terrible places online. Well, good. Uh, yeah, it's all really interesting. That that Georgia thing is super funny. Um, it's just yeah. such a weird. <laughs> God damn! It's like uh, uh, almost unintentional Gonzo journalism. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, for sure. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's. I've I've read some of it. it's really fucking. I mean, it's it's so crazy that it's funny, even though the subject matter isn't necessarily comedy. Yep. <laughs> but it's hard to fucking get through without laughing at some of it. Um, That's awesome. <clears throat> thank you. Yeah, looks. Thank, thanks for coming today. I uh, really appreciate yeah, your time. It's always a good conversation. Um, enjoy what yeah, you man. do. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me on, man. Yeah, man, anytime. And uh, thank you all for listening to this Bid Citizen.